Welcome, and thank you for joining us for this webinar presentation. We are the Defense Systems Information Analysis Center, or DSIAC, one of three IAC domains in the DOD Information Analysis Centers operating under the Defense Technical Information Center, DTIC, within the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Our informative webinar series highlights current and emerging research and technology developments. It presents an opportunity for accelerating the DOD's leverage of these advancements by increasing awareness and fostering technical collaboration. DSIAC serves as one of the premier information research partners and curators of technology advancements and trends for the defense systems community. As such, our organization supports those working in the defense systems domain of DOD research and engineering. We do so by helping navigate the vast landscape of scientific and technical information, allowing our customers to get a head start on their technical projects. With an understanding of the Defense Systems DoD research and engineering landscape, we provide research and analysis services. We help unlock access to information, knowledge, and best practices from government, industry, and academia to stimulate innovation, foster collaboration, and eliminate redundancy. We hope you enjoy this webinar presentation and that it serves as a catalyst for community collaboration and improved DOD defense systems research. Okay, good day everyone. Uh, my name is John Clements with the uh, Defense Systems Information Analysis Center. And I would like to welcome you all to today's webinar uh, presentation on applying the autonomous ground vehicle reference architecture to MBSE or the model based systems engineering. Uh, before we get started, I would just like to point out a couple of administrative items to you all. Uh, if you need a copy of today's slides, you can go to dsiac.org slash webinars and uh, click on today, find today's webinar listing, click on that and you'll see an option to download the presentation there and you'll be able to get a hold of it there. Um, if you are uh, uh, have some sort of technical difficulty uh, and you get dropped off or anything, uh, have no fear. There is, uh, we will be recording this webinar and it will be posted to the DSIAC YouTube channel uh, probably by tomorrow. Um, so just check back. And um, uh, I would also like to point out on the bottom right hand side, there's a three dot ellipses menu and you can open that up and there's a Q&A option in there. And so if you have questions for the presenter, uh, please post them in there. Uh, that's the best way to ensure that I can get them get to them and ask the presenter at the end. Uh, for the benefit of anybody on the phone, I'll be sure to uh, read the questions out loud and um, um, yeah, the presenter will answer them. Uh, I think that's about it for that. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's webinar presenter, Dr. Calvin Chung. Uh, Dr. Chung is a technical specialist at the U.S. Army DEVCOM Ground Vehicle Systems Center, where he focuses on exploring the convergence of model-based systems engineering and autonomous software development. He has worked in computer networking, cybersecurity, software engineering, and robotics. Dr. Chung holds a PhD from the University of Michigan, where his research focused on mitigating the effects of jamming attacks on autonomous convoys through behavior-based robotics. And with that, Dr. Chung, I'd like to turn it over to you. Sounds good. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome here today. I am going to start sharing my slides. Let's see, share. All right, can I get confirmation that uh, someone sees slides right now? I can see them, yes. Okay, great. Okay, yep, thanks for the introduction. Uh, as you mentioned, my name is Calvin Chung. I'm from the DEVCOM Ground Vehicle System Center, or GVSC. Uh, GVSC is the Department of Defense's Technology Laboratory and Engineering Center of Excellence for all ground vehicle advancement and development, providing leading edge capabilities to professional force. We accelerate delivery and statement of ground system capabilities to our partners, ensuring overmesh for our warfighters. That was clearly a boilerplate thing that I read out, but I wanted to get that out of the way so that we knew what GVSC was about. I am from the ground vehicle robotics, uh, specifically the robotic architecture, uh, robotic and autonomous software architecture and standards team. I'm the technical specialist for the group. I kind of end up being a bit of a jack of all trades where they ask me to pay 
dig more deeply into these areas topics so that we can get better understanding, uh, have a better idea of what we need to be doing with them, et cetera. And one such topic was model-based systems engineering, MBSC. So the purpose of this talk is to talk about autonomous ground vehicle reference architecture or AGVRA. It is uh, something that, that we've been working on on GVR and we're gonna go into what that is, how we've used it in GVR and give you some contact information if you wanna learn about more about it. So once again, application of the autonomous ground vehicle reference architecture to MBSE is the topic and we will get going. All right, so first off, what are we even talking about? Model-based systems engineering or MBSE. So model-based systems engineering is a formalized methodology that supports requirements, design analysis, verification, and validation associated with the development of complex systems. It puts models instead of documents at the center of system design, which allows for a single source of truth for different discipline-specific views. Uh, there's a fair amount of guidance from the DoD out there telling folks that they should be using MBSC for various reasons, including the DoD Digital Engineering Strategy, uh, DODI 5088, Engineering with Defense Systems, DODI 5097, Digital Engineering, and Army Directive uh, 202403, I believe it's also called MBSE, and this was released as recently as two, three weeks ago. So it's the guidance is quite uh, numerous and recent as they're still coming out with recommendations and instructions about how we should be and how we need to be using these. Uh, so per DOD guidance, MBSC can be applied to a variety of areas such as system design, program planning, mission engineering. This all facilitates agile development of, with high quality outcomes. Using MBSC enables a modular open systems acquisition strategy. It's a modular open systems approach, MOSA. Um, yes, it enables a MOSA acquisition strategy by helping implement some key MOSA principles such as employing modular design, designating key interfaces, and certifying conformance. The development of autonomous systems is a highly specialized field that brings together technical disciplines in various areas, such as control systems, software engineering, mechanical engineering, and electrical engineering. Autonomy-specific MBSC elements targeted to DoD autonomous ground vehicle efforts can help bring these various fields together in a common model-based approach to get the full benefits of MBSC. The HVRA, or Autonomous Ground Vehicle Reference Architecture, this is a giant mouthful, so I'm just going to say HVRA from here on out. Uh, but HVRA, developed by uh, GVSC, aims to provide the elements needed for successful autonomous ground vehicle MBSC efforts. HVRA provides small model libraries and a framework within which government and industry defense robotics partners can meet their objectives and realize the benefits of those MOSA principles that I talked about before. All right, so to get the official HVRA description all the way, I'm going to read that short sentence that says, HVRA is the reference architecture for autonomous ground vehicles that will provide architectural guidelines and best practices, business and technical for Army Robotics and Autonomous Systems RAS community. All right, so we got a lot of words there, but overall reference architecture, uh, what is it? Uh, well, defined by the DoD reference architecture description, a reference architecture has a common language for various stakeholders, gives consistency of implementation and technology to solve problems, like support for the validation of solutions against reference proven reference architectures, and encourages towards adherence to a common standard specification and patterns. And AGVRA provides a suite of SysML reference models, frameworks, and guidelines to provide that reference architecture for application of MBSC and the robotic time system development. It has a comprehensive set of views that include, but isn't limited to, uh, mission segments, data, interfaces, standards, and functional decomposition. So at the foundation of HVRA are multiple work products that are continuously refined via government and industry feedback. Uh, this got diagram kind of shows a superset of uh, everything that's available, such as governance and guidance, but the remainder of this presentation focuses on, I think, uh, what is going to be most important to modelers and systems engineers, which is the actual reference models themselves. All right, so what are the objectives of these models that we have in HVRA? Uh, they're to provide MBSE artifacts, support AGV system lifecycle management, enable generation of physical system architectures, and support plug and play, uh, product line plug and play in different target architectures. Overall, the HVRA libraries of reference models and reusable model patterns can be used to meet the objectives listed here. Uh, as you can see here, they are the IOP model, uh, the interface model library, functional decomposition model, uh, mission models, what these two models uh, end up comprising, 
and the data model framework. And all these are tied together in a view integration model. Uh, so with this next section, we're going to go through what each of these models are and what they do. All right, so first up is the mission models. Uh, these are profiles for mission engineering activities. They're used to decompose missions into model elements to support system design. Uh, the mission models have three main parts. Uh, the first part is the doctrine reference profile. This provides support for modeling traceability to uh, reference Army documents such as Army Doctrine, as shown here, international standards, and other publications. Uh, the doctrine reference profile is built upon uh, built on plain SysML and can be used in either UAF or uh, plain SysML models. Next is the large unit mission model. The large unit mission model provides support for modeling to the, the top level mission execution of Army Doctrine. It's meant to model the goals, capabilities, operational activities, and services provided by an organization. And finally, we have the small team model, uh, which provides support for modeling short tasks and maneuvers executed by a small team of vehicles. Uh, some examples of things that we've used this for is modeling out bounding overwatch, formation transitions, and positioning vehicles for firing angles. So next up is the functional decomposition model. Uh, the functional decomposition model provides the decomposition of abstracted autonomous system functions that can be used to build a system in the satisfaction of a particular mission. It provides a common language for representation of uh, RASG functions, including metadata. The metadata includes things such as the pedigree, maturity, measures of effectiveness, measures of performance, and responsible parties for those functions. Overall, it can uh, be used to help manage obsolescence of system components by providing insight into where the hierarchy of functions are vulnerable to new technologies, uh, how to mitigate and replace uh, these small modular components over time, and allows you to find potential gaps in technology that must be developed by exposing common functions performed in critical or dangerous mission segments. Uh, this uh, block definition diagram shows some of the uh, high-level functions that are in the functional decomposition model. So you can see such as perform perception, perform navigation, uh, perform autonomous maneuver. Uh, these get broken down into lower levels. Next is the IOP models. Uh, before we get into IOP model, we need to talk about what the IOP is. Uh, the RASG, Robotic Autonomous Systems Ground, RASG IOP Interoperability Profile, is a set of documents that profile standards to define the logical, physical, and electrical interfaces between major RASG subsystems. It's developed by joint government and industry working groups and has proven to reduce costs and testing time across various Army programs. The IOP model enables a model based representation of IOP concepts such as attributes, requirements, parameters, and instantiations. The profiles for the IOP models shown here are the source capture profile and the IOP profile. So the source capture profile uh, creates traceability back to your program's source capabilities, uh, <clears throat> descriptions, and requirements. And the IOP profile contains stereotypes for the core IOP constructs, which are the attributes, requirements, and parameters. Uh, project managers can leverage the overall IOP model to manage their IOP instantiations, both the source and the actual IOP profile itself, to allow everything to be captured in an MBSC approach. Next is the Interface Model Library, or IML. It provides a standard way to define interfaces commonly applied to RASG systems, as well as model library content to provide those interfaces as a starting point for RASG development. The IML is composed of uh, the latest IML profile, or the modeling language, and the model library content. Each model library describes interfaces that are either defined by standards or used in software frameworks commonly applied to ground vehicle robotic systems. The interfaces are modeled at a logical and physical level. Um, so the logical level details uh, the things such as the data used in the interfaces, the semantic data types. Uh, the physical level interface definition gives information about the actual implementation, such as storage type, encoding, and uh, those types of implementation details. So this is where the distinction between logical and physical lie. Uh, logical helps you talk about what the type of data is that's being talked about tied to uh, specific data types and other AGV area models that I'll further discuss. And the physical talks more about the implementation. So using the IML allows you to create mapping models between the physical and logical interfaces, showing how physical implementation and logical uh, definition of interfaces compare across different vendors and efforts. One potential way that this can be used, for example, is if the logical definitions can be uh, defined, but if you have multiple vendors using those same logical def definitions, you can see how their physical implementation of different vendors tie to a single logical implementation. 
So there's various ways that understanding the different level of uh, interfaces and the, uh, the relation between them uh, help with understanding the system overall and promote for kind of greater interoperability and understanding across systems. All right, what the IML uses that I mentioned before is the data model framework to tie things down to uh, common semantic data types. Um, what a data model framework is, is all of this. <laughs> So at the highest level, the data model framework or DMF is a meta model that establishes stereotypes for various kinds of elements and definitions of data types. Uh, down into the weeds, the, data, the DMF is based on concepts uh, and defined in the uh, SAE AS6969 data dictionary for quantities used in several physical systems. It contains a family of dictionaries meta model and a library of AS6969 classes. It also contains a value property meta model, which is used to create the AS6969 conformant joint common data type library or JCDL. Uh, these meta models and libraries are used in the HVARI data model and IML, as I mentioned, along with other architectures. And the DMF and JCDL are defined at the conceptual and logical levels, which I described, um, which are platform independent. And finally, we have the view integration model, which is an example of how all the HVRA model work products can be used to model a system in an emission context. Although each individual model within HVRA can be used independently, the VIM or VIA view integration model provides a view of how it's all possible to link them together in a cohesive example, provides a bounding overwatch model that fully demonstrates the unified example of HVRA and demonstrates the profiles, patterns, and type libraries provided by HVRA models. Uh, based on an operational vignette for a scout platoon with autonomous ground vehicles. So that is kind of the summary of all the models that exist within HVRA. And to fully realize the benefits of MBSC, it's vital to leverage those reusable modeling elements in the development of autonomous systems. The libraries, profiles, and model content that HVRA provided can be leveraged to facilitate this robotic and autonomous system MBSC design. Uh, AGVRA has been utilized across multiple DOD efforts to meet the MBSC needs and enabling the benefits of the higher quality outcomes at a lower cost uh, with the adherence to the most principles. The following section details some of the key applications of the AGVRA models in past and ongoing efforts. All right, so first up, we're going to talk about GCIA, or the Ground Combat Systems Common Infrastructure Architecture, GCIA. Uh, so GCIA uh, applies an MBSC approach to bridge the gap between existing standards and architectures and the acquisition and development processes in a GCIA ground vehicle program, provides an objective architecture for network and infrastructure in a ground combat system, and a data architecture that defines things such as the MBSC languages, rules of construction, and reusable model libraries of existing standards and components uh, to be used by programs and vendors. So the GCIA DA, the data architecture uh, models are defined using the AGVRA IML profile and extend the AGVRA IML libraries, which includes utilization of the DMF data model framework and JCDL joint common data type library. The use of AGVRA IML in the GCIA data architecture ties all interfaces definitions to the same semantic data types, promoting reusability, compatibility, along with other design benefits such as automatic transformation of data sets based on their semantic data types, and a drag and drop capability of IML service models into a system architecture model. The next example of an application of HVRA is uh, Cover. So it's GVSE's Combat Vehicle Robotics or Cover program. Uh, Cover is an Army ST effort focused on maturing uh, AGV technology to operate as part of a man unmanned team. Uh, in Cover, there's the concept of EETs, engineering evaluation tests which are events conducted to assess the progress and the maturation of technology. Uh, the cover program and the EET events, however, throughout the years have grown both in program partners and the number of technologies being evaluated. So it helped manage this growth and MBSA approach using AGVRA for the cover program and EET events was used. The EET, the cover EET mission models developed, uh, were developed using a, the AGVRA SML reference model frameworks, uh, guidelines and models specifically we leverage the small teams mission model and the functional decomposition model. Uh, using those two models allowed us to also to generate uh, tests, uh, creating a test plan generation tool. The AGVRA models allowed cover system engineers to account for the mission capabilities, proposed tests, and fit to evaluate the capabilities and the proposed operational design domain for evaluations and unified model. 
So through the use of the AGPRA, we're allowed, we were able to do that sort of test generation to be used in the EETs and to make sure to be able to track and manage all these aspects, such as the uh, operational design domain, the capabilities and things in a single model source of truth approach. All right, next we're gonna talk about the RTK, uh, Robotic Technology Kernel IOP efforts. So RTK, Robotic Technology Kernels, was GVSC's ros one based autonomous software library for AGV mobility. And just to be clear, it's not on these slides. Um, ROS2 version of the autonomous software library is called the Army Robotic Common Software Library, or ARCS. So RTK is what we call the ROS1 library, and ARCS is what we call the ROS2 library. I just wanted to make that uh, distinction clear because I think ARCS is also something that is a highly relevant topic for a lot of people possibly on this call. And if you want to know more about RTK or ARCs, you can reach out to me and the contact information that we'll list after this program, and I can put you all in touch with the right people to talk about these topics. But in any case, uh, for historical accuracy, I'm using the term RTK because this was for the ros one version. So RTK leverages an IOP bridge to communicate with robotic controllers. Uh, in other words, using IOP allows RTK to take full advantage of interoperability that the IOP provides with the ability to use different IOP compliant controllers to communicate with RTK. So doing so required an, uh, an IOP bridge, however, uh, which bridged the RTK messages with the different controller messages, which is then what is used to talk to the various controllers that the IOP has. Uh, this IOP bridge uh, needed to updates, however, uh, for great, greater maintainability and extensibility for the future. The HVRA IOP models were utilized in the RTK IOP bridge updates by leveraging the source capability profile, which is used to capture RTK's requirements for the RTK IOP bridge, and the IOP profile itself was used to model the IOP instantiation needed to meet the requirements. By leveraging the AGVRA IOP model, the developers are able to generate a maintainable model of the RTK IOP bridge to be used for current and future development efforts, which provided a digital artifact for a consistent source of truth towards future updates and other efforts utilizing uh, RTK. And finally, let's talk about HVRA and SAE standards. Uh, SAE International is a globally active professional association focused on mobility solutions, uh, they release consensus-based standards to improve on the design of safety, productivity, dependability, and efficiency in the fields of things such as aerospace, automotive, and commercial vehicles. The AGVRA Data Model Framework, or DMF, uh, provides a digital data model of the conceptual data types, logical data types, and properties that are used by various SAE standards, such as SAE 6969 and the 6518B. So having the consistent digital models for these data types allows for improved clarity, quality, and consistency. So in turn, these SAE standards are utilized in various DOD efforts, such as Navy's PMA-281 uh, unmanned system common control system and the Army's universal ground control station, uh, allowing HVRE's impact to be felt and, uh, across the services in a meaningful way. Uh, so that concludes the applications that I'm sharing about how what HVRA has been used across uh, the DoD. So in conclusion, uh, HVRA provides autonomous ground vehicle specific reference architectures and models, which helps accelerate MBSC development of REST programs and R&D efforts. It's been utilized across the Army and Navy efforts to leverage key interfaces and open standards in a MOSA approach. And it strives to publish and maintain the Army's RAS meta architecture to facilitate AGV MBSC through continued development and expansion. Uh, we have a website, https colon slash slash agvary.org, that gives some information that I mentioned here. It has some more diagrams, um, other aspects of information to help you understand what's going on, and a link to get in touch with the people in charge of AGVRA. So that concludes all I have for today. Um, I'm ready for any questions or comments. All right, well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Chung. So we do have a couple questions that have ro rolled in. Uh, the first one, uh, I'm gonna try to read out the acronyms here. So is there a releasable interoperability profile model for robotic and autonomous systems ground? And similarly, is there one for RAS A air? Uh, for the Brown one, RAS G. Uh, there is one, and if you go to agvary.org, you can get put in touch. They link you to who to contact to get access to the agvary models, 
once you get access to that, they should be able to grant you access to the IOP uh, model, which has the source capability profile and the IOP profile that I mentioned. Uh, our focus has been on the ground systems, so uh, we don't have any content on the air side. Um, there is potential that there is something available on the air side, and I can look into that and just try to see if I can get any information. But in terms of what we have for HVRA, uh, that's going to be focused solely on, on the ground side. Perfect, thank you. Uh, next question, does AGVRA have uh, have an integrated capability validation model? model? EETs are white box, whereas capability validation should be done as black box. Uh, so I think right now there is uh, no validation model as uh, specified there. I think that is something that we are potentially looking at to incorporate in the future to help allow for that type of uh, validation that was being referenced. And I think as we go down further in the development of AGVRA, uh, we are kind of responding to what the community uh, values and needs. And we can look at what the people who have been doing things such as those uh, cover ETs and what they feel is of the greatest value to what we are doing. And if that is something that is uh, very vital to the continuous utilization of HVRA, we will be sure to prioritize it in future developments. Okay, and then the uh, the next question is, uh, is DMF, the data model framework, fully compliant with the SAE standards? Uh, so I think the DMF, data model framework, models out the uh, concepts in the SAE AS6969. And in turn, I think the SAE has then taken the DMF uh, and used it within their standards because it provides that a uh, digital model artifact for their standards. So I think I can speak specifically to the SE uh, 6969, the quantities for several physical systems, that it, it is compliant and whatever is based upon that um, 6969 standard, uh, I think we can say that would be compliant in that way. Uh, I am not an expert in the SAE standards. So if I'm moving over some things, uh, there's probably a greater level of specificity that uh, we can get, uh, but the best way for that would be to reach out to the AGVRA org website that I mentioned. At a high level, though, I'm going to say that, yes, based on the tight relationship, working relationship we have between the 6969 standards and the modeling out of those for the data model framework. All right, thank you so much for that. Um, got a couple more questions in here. Um, this one, um, what is ACCDC's definition of a reference architecture and what criteria went into the decision to include physical models beyond established standards, such as the SAE standard, specifically RTK? Um, I'm unfamiliar with their acronym. Can you read that again? So, of course, I was, I was, um, I don't know if you mean CCDC, like as in DevCom, what is oh, okay. ACCDC's definition of a reference architecture and what criteria went into the decision to include physical models beyond established standards, uh, specifically RTK? Hmm. So the reference architecture uh, definition that I had used for this uh, wasn't specifically from um, DevCom. I think it was there was greater level uh, DoD guidance that I pulled from that, and it gave kind of more of a general definition of what a reference architecture should be, and I use that to kind of compare what we had been doing and how it fits into that. Uh, I think for this specific question, I will probably need to get on a deeper level discussion rather than answer kind of anything in kind of um, more general terms. So if you, uh, if the person who uh, had that question could go to the HVRA site, reach out to the contact information there, um, they can put us in touch and then we can kind of get into details uh, about what was the thought behind that and uh, how we can, how we can better answer that question for you. Great. Now, just a reminder, there's a couple more questions, but just a reminder to folks, uh, DSI Act has a technical inquiry service. So if you're struggling to get the information through that site or, or uh, other means, uh, you can always submit a technical inquiry to us and uh, we can do the research on your behalf as long as you are 
a government employee or a contractor fu funded to do government work, uh, then uh, we can help you out. So just keep that in mind. Anybody that's listening to this webinar, um, it's part of why we exist. So uh, I'll move on to the next question. Uh, how would you suggest that small army robotics uh, research and development teams use AGVRA during development of their ROS2 software stack and standards for vehicles with environmental interaction instead of just A to B navigation capabilities? So I think for the kind of uh, physical level um, modeling there, uh, there are some things such as the um, in-face model library, which is uh, especially relevant because it allows for the greater design of the interoperability and ensuring that the interfaces for whatever the small software robots are doing um, match up with uh, other efforts uh, that might leverage HVRA. I think the small, um, the, there's a mission model, the, the small task model efforts, the small task module, um, sorry. There's the large unit mission and the small task mission models, I believe that's what, yeah, the small task mission models. I think those can help you help uh, define uh, the kind of mission space and how things are breaking down into what the small robots need to do. And those can then be tied to the functional decompositions to uh, better specify what each of the autonomous function is that meets uh, what the specific small unit mission is being accomplished. Uh, once you have those links drawn, uh, you can better understand what functions need to be uh, further developed or iterated upon, or perhaps um, what's missing and allow you to understand uh, where your investments need to be for further development or perhaps um, searching for uh, other solutions. Um, so this is just kind of me trying to whiteboard uh, mentally in front of this black thank you screen. That's another one of those things, however, if you want to reach out, we can discuss more about what a way that we could get together and talk about how AGVR can be leveraged to support those kinds of needs as well. Wonderful. Uh, the next question might be some, some more uh, mental whiteboarding here. Uh, do, do you have any suggestions for some resources and direction for a UCS for UCS system development? Uh, for UCS system development, uh, yeah, I think that's another thing where I think we have some things in hand, but I'm not sure I can kind of list them off the top of my head. If you want to reach out again from the HVRA org site, we can get put in touch and I can make sure I can, um, that you have the right resources that we can refer to and have this further discussion. Okay, and then uh, you mentioned logical physical interfaces. Does AGVRA cover data distribution services? Uh, the data distribution services is not something that uh, AGVRA specifies. I think from the uh, level that AGVRA uh, and the SMA models uh, look at things, the data distribution service is uh, almost lower than physical, where it gives a level of specificity that HVRA isn't looking uh, to try to prescribe or that we are gathering information to talk about. Because I'm assuming by data distribution services, you're talking about like the different types of uh, DDS, like uh, the R RTI or, or uh, eProxima. And I understand that those, there are a lot of different data distribution services uh, that are available and even different types of technologies that aren't DDS specific. Uh, but I think those are lower levels of implementation that we want to be able to support uh, by going up at a more higher level in terms of uh, conceptually how things are linked up. So we have, as I mentioned, the physical implementation level, which talks about the specificity of the uh, information there down to like data types and implementation. And then higher is logical, which talks about the uh, type of data. And there's even a higher level of that, which is the conceptual type, which is like the highest level of the concept of what you're talking about. So for instance, a conceptual type might be speed, a logical type might be miles per hour, which is a more greater specificity than speed. And a physical uh, might be saying a 32 bit integer. And then once you get down below that of how you want to transmit the data, uh, this is not something right now that HVRA is looking to specify, but hopefully by having the information about what the physical and logical data types are, 
that allows various systems, regardless of whatever uh, DDS or data sharing mechanism they use, to be able to ensure that there is a common understanding and a commonality of what's being sent through the wire uh, for those types of interfaces. Okay, great. Um, looking at another question here in the chat, uh, could the result from the EET event be used to support the validation of requirements? Uh, typically the right side of the system engineering v-chart if so how would the model meet the requirements of dodi 5000.61 so i think for the do uh, for the eet uh, modeling a lot of that was primarily used for the test generation aspect i think if a uh, greater level of detail was put into the rest of the model to uh have that type of information then it can definitely be used uh, as you're described to uh, help meet those but uh, at the current level i think it was primarily the, the purpose of it was primarily for the generation of the test events to eliminate the burden and the manual labor needed uh, when it was possible to do this in a more generated and automated fashion but I think that's something that probably warrants a further follow up on as well, where we can talk about the level of detail that was included, uh, maybe what level of details can be added to meet those further needs. So I think that's another one that I would love to have further conversation about if you want to reach out on the uh, AGRA org site to the POCs. Okay, and then uh, one more question on the conceptual level are cybersecurity provisions integrated in the model? Uh, I think for cyber security, uh, some of those aspects are potentially built into the whole functional decomposition part. I think there are aspects of uh, functionality of autonomous systems where the need for cyber and the importance of it is uh, baked into what it's doing. Uh, I would say that there are no specific model libraries uh, that deal with cyber right now in AGVRA. That could be something that is uh, upcoming in the future. I think a lot of the things that we have right now can be incorporated into various models that do account for uh, cybersecurity. Uh, but I think right now the closest thing that we have that we would be able to use to account for cyber would be in the functional decomposition. And the other aspects as, such as the um, IML, the interface model library, uh, things about how the mission uh, might need to be performed with the mission models. There are certainly aspects there that would be informative for uh, in, in the cyber domain. But I think in terms of an actual AGVRA model library or reference model in AGVRA that has cyber, uh, that's something that we are looking to in the future to see if there's a demand signal from that and moving on from there. Great, thank you. There's a few more questions. If uh, so. Uh, what are if you have an answer to this question? What are your thoughts on Ross ecosystem? And they posted a website. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Uh, yeah, I'm familiar with Ross. So I think it has been very positive in terms of having a wide community of autonomous systems and software to help pro from to give the starting points to have the framework and you know pipeline to allow for the um, more standardized development of a uh, robotic autonomous system. Uh, I think ROS itself, uh, obviously there's a lot of good stuff out there, but there's a lot of stuff that's done by academics and by uh, people that are not nearly as mature in terms of the processes that we might want for software engineering. So I think for us in GVSC and uh, Ground uh, Vehicle Robotics, um, we look at the whole ecosystem and look at what is of high quality and are working in additional processes to ensure that the ROS packages that we use are vetted and are well understood and that they are of high quality. There's a whole concept of a ROS M, a ROS military, where we at GVR, uh, Ground Vehicle Robotics, are only taking in um, software that we understand that is uh, vetted and accepted in the uh, kind of the, the whole Ross military do domain, which allows us to make sure that we're using uh, high quality packages uh, that are not just random student, the uh, random student development projects out there in the open. So Ross overall, I, I think is great. It's allowed the robotics community a level of standardization and a way to springboard their efforts that didn't exist before. And I think leveraging ROS has given a lot of great benefits, both industry, academia, and government in the 
further development and continue iteration of robotics itself. Okay. Um, is zero trust architectures inclusion part of the roadmap in this model? I think um, I sort of answered this in the previous question, but okay. I think that's something that we can look to as we potentially look to more uh, cyber related uh, mo model libraries and models. I know that zero trust is definitely the way that everything has been going uh, from the DoD. There are various uh, papers, DoD instructions, guidances, directives that are making it very clear that the concept of zero trust uh, needs to be how our overall systems need to be maintained with the whole concept of limiting the blast radius and ensuring continued verification. The level of uh, implementation that zero trust talks about, I think right now is at potentially at a different or yeah, it's not quite what the AGVRA uh, reference models uh, talk about with the focus being on the uh, autonomous uh, ground vehicles, but there are elements of it that will potentially fit into what we're doing right now and uh, what we're doing right now can be fitted into other uh, architecture efforts or modeling efforts that talk about zero trust. So yeah, definitely understood that zero trust is essentially from my vantage point, like the, the number one cyber um, aspect in the DoD right now. And I think as we look to continue to mature HVRA and include those uh, cyber aspects, uh, you can't get away from zero trust. That is definitely the way to go based on guidance. And I think based on the overall security standpoint. So we'll be looking at that as well. Well, that is great. And uh, thank you so much. I think that wraps up the Q&A session. So uh, Dr. Chung, thank you very much for uh, that overview and that presentation. Uh, it was definitely a lot to absorb. So for anybody <laughs> looking for more information, please feel free to uh, submit a technical inquiry either through the DSI Act website, or you could just email contact at dsiac.org. Uh, but again, Dr. Chung, thank you so much for the presentation today. Yep, my pleasure. Thank you all for taking the time to listen. Have a good lunch if you haven't eaten it already. <laughs> thank you. Okay, bye.